part of this. Is that better? It's just too loud. One excellent scholar, actually more than one excellent scholar, but Amalia is our current excellent scholar. And I put you on notice actually, because all of you here are very, very welcome to apply to study at Cambridge University uh, and to come to Hughes Hall, the history of which is there on the, the chair for you all to read. So I hope to steal a, a few of you for, for the college, but return you to Yerevan, where you can do great things like the other uh, Lois, uh, as I call it, Lewis Foundation scholars. So what, I, what I'm going to talk about now is, is uh, I'm going to talk about, I suppose, some philosophical issues relating to um, democratization uh, of, 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 of intellectual property, uh, just to take up the theme that Jacqueline touched upon there. And I'll also uh, I'll go on to talk about the experience of UK universities, especially Cambridge University, of course, because, because I can speak uh, about that. And then I'll go down the next level to the college. Uh, Cambridge University has 31 colleges, of which, of course, we're one. Uh, and we, uh, as Aaron said, set up uh, an enterprise society in 2014. And I'll give you one particular example at the end of my presentation, which I, you, you can, on the subject of democratization, you can take away and use at no cost whatsoever no patent, no licensing. Um, actually, one other person to, to mention before I start the presentation is Garen, who, who I sat next to on the aeroplane on the way here, and he said, what are you doing here? And I told him, and he said, oh, I'll come along and, and, and listen to you. And in spite of listening to me on the aeroplane, he's still here. So, so I admire your, 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 your patience. <laughs> nice, to, nice to see you, Garen. So, so this, is, this is okay in terms of volume. Is this okay in terms of volume? So universities, uh, universities historically have had two missions uh, since the, the, the first universities uh, were opened in Europe in the 13th century, came to be one of the first teaching and research. Much more recently, probably take the origins. Uh, can you hear me again, or shall I speak? I'll keep wondering, wondering about it, because that's my, that's my habit is to, my habit is to, is that correct? In that case, I'll say, yeah, I'll wonder about it. So, the universities traditionally, two missions, teaching and research, and you, you, might, you, you might take the beginning of the third mission, uh, of entrepreneurship as, as beginning at Stanford uh, in the 60s. MIT would be another originator, Cambridge following thereafter in, in Europe. Um, and so it's interesting that this third mission has been added to the, the traditional historic missions of, 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 of universities. This brings a lot of good things with it, but it also brings some things which uh, not bad things necessarily, but which are challengeable. So what I'm going to do is talk about the two sides of the, of the coin in terms of the, the good and bad aspects of bringing entrepreneurialism 
into our campuses and having posters everywhere demanding that all of our students become entrepreneurs in quite an insistent way sometimes. I'm then going to talk about the Cambridge experience, which I think resolves some of the uh, conflicts quite nicely. You can be the best judge of that. And then I'll also just give some, some practical examples of, of what's going on in Cambridge, but we can talk about those in more detail in a question and answer session at the end, if that sounds all right. So I'll talk for 20 minutes, but I usually go on a little bit, as, as Goen will tell you. So I'm going to, I'm going to begin with a, a story about a stove. Can anyone translate the word stove for me, in case people don't know what it means? Stove, uh, 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 it's something which heats wood. Can you shout? Varagan. Varagan. Just tell everyone, okay. Stove, does everyone know what a stove is? I'm taking you back to 1742 and the, the, the stove of, of 1742. Benjamin Franklin, uh, better known for, for other things, uh, such as being the US president, uh, uh, also was a, you know, a, quite a remarkable man, actually. I'm not here to talk about Benjamin Franklin, except to say he's, he's a, remarkable, a remarkable man. America produces a lot of remarkable men, as we've, as, as we've seen recently. <laughs> <laughs> so his, his stove, uh, so to put this very, very simply, um, his stove uh, created more heat and less smoke. Um, so so that, that's the essence of it. And, and, and this, is what he, this is what he said, writing in 1742 about his stove. I know you didn't come here expecting to hear about stoves, but it's a nice, it's a nice surprise for everybody. I made a present of the model to a Mr. Robert Grace, who, having an iron furnace, found these stoves a profitable thing. To promote that demand, I wrote and published a pamphlet entitled An Account of the New Invented Pennsylvania Fireplace, where in their construction, sorry, fireplaces, where in their construction and manner of operation is particularly explained, their advantages over every other method of warming rooms demonstrated, Pennsylvania Governor Thomas, this is, this is still uh, the, the, the letter of Franklin, Pennsylvania Governor Thomas was so pleased with the stove, as described in the paper, that he offered a patent for the sale, the exclusive sale and vending of them of the, for a term of years. I declined it, this is the important bit, I declined the patent from a principle which has ever weighed on me on such occasions. And the principle that weighed on Franklin on such occasions was that he, what he said was, I didn't want to take particular advantage uh, of an invention when so many other inventions had benefited me in my lifetime and my friends and family. And I, so I was happy to share it with everyone. So I declined it from a principle which has ever weighed on me on such occasions. Um, so, so marvelous man. As, as, I, as I say, so just bear in mind the story of the of the of the, the stove. So universities take on this third role of entrepreneurship and innovation and commercialising knowledge. Uh, you could take a very Marxist view, view of this that that the that the the, 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 the the source of economic power now is is in people's minds. It isn't in coal mines, and of course it is to an extent. And it is to an extent in gas fields and so on, but a great source of, of economic power is people's minds. And the companies, of course, you know, want to want to take advantage of this. Traditionally, universities have been have had they've always had links with commercial operations, but never of a particularly close and collaborative kind until until fairly recently. So you might describe a, a, the universities as a fountainhead of, of public of public knowledge. Um, characterized by open dissemination of this knowledge and sharing open disclosure. So the Benjamin Franklin model of, 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 of the diffusion of knowledge in a democratic way. Property protection is, uh, uh, is inevitably part of this, part of this story. The, uh, but, but governments have recognized that, that, that universities are, in, in a knowledge economy, that they're the most efficient, essentially. They're the most efficient mechanism for transferring knowledge and making it marketable and, and, and profiting from it. 
um, and, and this this can this can create problems. So we're, we're talking about the, the kind of problems to go back to the Benjamin Franklin quote, which can arise from uh, patents um, and, and licensing and so on, licensing agreements. Knowledge is essentially it, it is retained. Uh, it's made uh, secret uh, in a restrictive network of, uh, of, of elites, let, 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 let's face it, um, to, uh, to whom universities may, to some extent, become, the danger is that they will become subservient to, uh, to, these, to the market forces. Um, and so anyway, market orientation is introduced into research, which is never really uh, present before, or at least was, was, was very, very marginally present. Of course, always, people have always made money from their research. The history of patents actually goes back much further. There are patents in Venice. There are very possibly patents in ancient Greece. There are reference to what sound like patents in, in, in ancient Greece. Um, so the, the, clearly people have restricted knowledge for their own profit. Um, but, but generally speaking, universities, that hasn't, been, that hasn't been their role. This is particularly interesting when we live in a, an age of um, uh, new para paradigms of, of innovation. Uh, open sourcing, crowd funding, so quite democratic uh, paradigms of, of innovation. So you have on the one hand open sourcing in this democratic dynamic, and then on the other you have a more restrictive, potentially restrictive dynamic of, 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 of closed knowledge and, and, and patents and, and, and so on. Um, so the, the entrepreneurial university clearly has, you know, that it brings great benefits. You introduce uh, new funding streams, you create a diversity of interest, you create a, a, a range of funding streams instead of being pretty much entirely dependent on, on, uh, on government. And actually, the people talk, just a, an aside, American universities, many of the best of which, including Stanford, are private. Um, Berkeley, for example, is, is public. They still depend on, on federal money for research, so it's taxpayers' money which is, which is often forming the foundation of their, their research funds, it isn't just private